أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته ووتد بالصخور ميدان أرضه والصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا وطبيب نفوسنا وسندنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين الميامين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد وقوله الحق المبين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نبئ عبادي أني أنا الغفور الرحيم وأن عذابي هو العذاب الأليم صدق الله العلي العظيم My respected elders, my dearest youngsters, brothers and sisters in Iman Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh In yesterday's lecture, we tried to shed light on the forgiveness and the mercy and love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reserved for all his servants. And I received a few questions about some of the riwayat and traditions that we mentioned yesterday. And obviously they, they bring to mind a very important point which I would like to issue as a clarification. When we talk about the mercy and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ahadith and the verses of the Quran that describe it are so moving and so powerful that we sometimes have to be careful when we approach them and also when we present them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, each and every single quality and attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is limitless and it is absolute. So obviously when we talk about it, the impression that we get is a very powerful and a very strong impression. And that is why it has to be balanced by a discussion of the other side of the picture as well. When we talk about the mercy and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the amount of forgiveness, how ready and how willing he always is to forgive his servants and accept them back, if we only discuss that from one side and we give a one-sided picture of it, it might embolden some people to take the whole issue of sin very lightly. Because sometimes when you read these riwayat that tell us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a promise that he will forgive us for as long as our souls are in our bodies, he will never close the door of repentance, he's always willing to accept us, we sometimes can then think, okay, so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always willing to forgive me and accept me back, then whenever a sin presents itself before me, I don't have to resist it. I can give in to that temptation and I can always get up and dust myself and, you know, become as good as ever. But you have to understand it is not as simple as that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Quran, the picture that he gives you, the way he has made the laws, the policy has been designed to favor you. But it doesn't mean that you can go on committing sins with impunity. And it doesn't mean that you can exploit the love and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you have both sides to the picture. The verse of the Quran that I recite in front of you is from surah number 15 of the Quran, surah al-Hajr, verses 49 and 50. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs his prophet. He says, ibadi anni anal rahim." O my prophet, tell my servants that I am very forgiving and I am very merciful. But But my punishment and my retribution is also very severe. I'm very firm when it comes to punishment. So you have to focus on both sides. Obviously, there is so much on, I, on each side that you cannot use one lecture to shed light on both aspects. The aspects of Allah's mercy and the aspects of the anger and wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they're both there and we should focus on both of them. Because both of them are realities that we need to understand and that we need to register. Every night when we recite Dua Al-Iftitah, how does the Dua begin? The Imam begins the Dua by reminding you of both these two features. 
So he says, Allahumma inni aftatihu thana'a bihamdik wa anta musaddidun lil-sawabi bimannik. After beginning and initiating the dua with the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Imam makes a very emphatic and categorical statement. He says, wa aiqantu annaka anta arhamu ar-rahimina fi mawdi'i al-afwi wa-rahma wa ashaddu al-mu'aqibina fi mawdi'i al-nakali وَالنَّقِمَ وَأَعْظَمُ الْمُتَجَبِّرِينَ فِي مَوْضِعِ الْكِبْرِيَاءِ وَالْعَظَمَ The Imam says, Ya Allah, I declare with full and absolute certainty and conviction that أَنَّكَ أَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ That you are indeed the most merciful of those who show mercy when it comes to showing mercy and when it comes to pardoning and forgiving. There is no one who is more merciful and more forgiving than you. But at the same time, immediately after that he says, وَأَشَدُّ الْمُعَاقِبِينَ فِي مَوْضِعِ النَّكَالِ وَالنَّقِمَ But he says, Ya Allah, as I recognize that you are the most merciful of those who show mercy when it comes to forgiving and showing mercy, you are also at the very same time the most the most stern and the most severe when it comes to your punishment and your retribution. There is no one who is more firm and more severe in matters of punishment and retribution than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَعْظَمُ الْمُتَجَبِّرِينَ فِي مَوْضِعِ الْكِبْرِيَاءِ وَالْعَظَمَ And he says, Ya Allah, I recognize the fact that you are the greatest when it comes to displays of might and majesty and greatness. There is no one greater than you. So there are both sides to the picture, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a carrots and sticks policy. The reason why we often try to focus more on the mercy and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is because sometimes the way things are presented uh, from the member, we get a very scary picture of our religion and especially the youth are disenchanted because of it. Because you feel like the religion is so strict and there are so many punishments. A lot of the times the traditions that are narrated from the member are very scary. And that's why, you know, sometimes people blame the Molanas for it. They're like, you know, a Molana fine nati, you know, he's, he's always scaring us. There was a Molana we had in India, people used to refer to him as Molana Mot. He was, he was always talking about death and, you know, scaring people. But what you need to know is that it's a carrot and sticks policy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has create, created, as he says in the Quran, وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانِ In the hereafter, there is both. There is abundant reward and there is very terrible punishment as well. All of these are realities and we need to register all of these realities. We need to be conscious of them. We cannot take the idea of sin lightly. Because Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu wa sallam, when he talks about the issue of sin, he used to say, La tamdhur ila sigar al khati'ah, walakin indhur man asayt. He used to say, any sin, when it comes in front of you, do not look at how small it is. You might think it's a very minute sin, so I can do it. No, he says, do not look at the minuteness of the sin, look at whom you are disobeying. Because every sin, whether it is major or minor, it is an act of disobedience against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you approach every sin with this perspective, that this is, it might be very small, it might be very minute, but it is an act of disobedience against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the universe. If you approach sins with this perspective, you will view them with the importance that you are supposed to view them with. So you cannot take this idea. The other thing that we'd mention, the, the policy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the principle of divine accounting uh, that has been mentioned in Surah Al-An'am, Surah number 6 of the Quran, whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ فَلَا يُجْزَى إِلَّا مِثْلَهَا وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ That whoever comes with one good deed will get ten times the reward of that single good deed. When you perform a good deed, Allah writes ten. When you perform an evil deed, He only writes one. Again, this might embolden some people to think, okay, as long as we are doing good deeds, there is no problem if we, you know, commit sins. As long as we have good deeds, the good deeds will cancel out the sins. And Allah has that mechanism. He tells us in Surah Hud that وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ طَرَفَ النَّهَارِ وَزُلَفًا مِّنَ اللَّيْلِ إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ The good deeds that you do, Allah uses them to cancel out the evil deeds and the sins that you've done. So that policy is there. But you cannot exploit it. You cannot think that, okay, if I've done 10 good deeds today, then I can do at least a few sins, they will cancel out. Because this mentality is a very dangerous mentality. We, they, we had this even during the lifetime of the Imams. We were told of an incident during the lifetime of our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam wa alayhi. We were told that the Imam was walking through the streets of Medina when he came across this guy who we could only describe in modern terms today as a, as a Robin Hood. He was a Robin Hood of, of some sort. What he would do is he would rob, he would basically go around plundering and, and stealing from different shops that were there and he would go and give that to the poor. 
So the Imam noticed this. He was once walking through the streets of Medina. He comes across this man who breaks into this grocery shop and he starts to steal the food items and he collects them into a bag and he starts going. When he started leaving, the Imam approached him and he came up to him and he said, what are you doing? So this person, he realized now that he had been caught. So he turned to the Imam and he said, you see, you might think I'm doing something very wrong, but actually I have a justification for it. I have it all figured out. The Imam said, what's your explanation? He said, yeah, Imam, you see, what I do is, I've read the Quran, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, man jaa bil hasanati, falahu ashru amthaliha, wa man jaa bil sayyati, fala yudza illa mithlaha. Whoever does a good deed gets ten times the reward. So ten good deeds are written. Whoever does an evil deed, only one evil deed is written. So what I did here was an evil deed. I admit that. I acknowledge that. I stole. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote one evil deed in my deeds. Now I'm going to take all these food items, and I'm going to distribute them among the poor people. So how many good deeds will I get for that? Well, for every poor person that I feed, I'll get at least 10 good deeds. So at the end of the day, I have one evil deed in my account and several good deeds. And those several good deeds will cancel out the evil deed that I've done. So even if I feed just one poor person, 10 good deeds are written in my account and one evil deed. So one evil deed gets canceled out. I still have a profit of nine good deeds that are written in my account. See, that was the math that he was doing. The Imam turned to him, he smiled, he said, no, this is not the way it works. You have to read the whole Quran. You're just reading one part of it. You can't cherry pick verses. No. He says, do you know that Allah in the very same Quran, he has also said, and you're missing out on this, Allah has said, innama, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Surah number five, he says, innama yataqabbalullahu min al muttaqin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only accepts the good deeds of those who have taqwa. Those who do good deeds with sincerity and taqwa. So basically, you are stealing here. This itself is a representation of the fact that you don't have taqwa. If you had taqwa, you wouldn't be stealing from someone else. You'd be giving from your own money. So the fact that you are stealing and you're disobeying Allah means you have no taqwa. And without taqwa, none of the good deeds are accepted. So it's not like Allah is writing one evil deed here and ten good deeds there. No, no good deed is being written in your account. The only thing that's been written down is the evil deed that you are performing. So, and that's why if, if our earning and our income is haram, it doesn't matter how much you spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has made the principle in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah only accepts from those who are sincere and who are righteous. So we cannot exploit this principle in thinking that, okay, we can perform sins and we can perform good deeds. The good deeds will just simply cancel them out. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts only those deeds that are done with taqwa. And that's why the sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamu he used to say, لا يقل عمل مع تقوى وكيف يقل ما يتقبل. He used to say, the good thing, if, if you have taqwa, your good deeds will never fall short. The, the small good deeds and the little number of good deeds that you do with taqwa, they never fall short. Why? Because what Allah accepts never falls short. So if on the day of judgment you have done a few good deeds, but you did them with taqwa, they will benefit you because they will be counted. If you have done so many good deeds without taqwa, Allah won't even count them. They won't be written in your account. So you have to be careful of that. This is a reality that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt always used to remind, remind us of, that you need to constantly remind yourself of the fact that Allah is very forgiving and merciful, but at the same time you cannot exploit and you cannot find loopholes in His laws. At the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of your intentions. He knows your niyat. And he wants you to know that uh, as far as the question of tawbah and forgiveness is concerned, he's very forgiving, but that is only in the case of mistakes. You cannot leave your whole, you cannot lead your whole life in sins and then expect that at the end it will all be forgiven. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though he has made the conditions of tawbah very simple, there still are conditions, there still are rules. And one of those rules is that you don't get to perform sins with impunity and then Allah just erases them towards the end of your life or especially at the time of death. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nisa, Surah number 4 of the Quran, verses 17 and 18, He gives us the requirement and the conditions under which tawbah is accepted. And so one of those conditions th that we are informed in that verse is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا التَّوْبَةُ عَلَى اللَّهِ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السُّوءَ بِجَهَالَةٍ ثُمَّ يَتُوبُونَ مِنْ قَرِيبٍ فَأُولَٰئِكَ يَتُوبُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah accepts the tawbah of those people who fall into sins by mistake, not deliberately. They fall into sins due to their ignorance or by mistake and then they recover from it immediately. ثُمَّ يَتُوبُونَ مِنْ قَرِيبٍ They repent quickly. They turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately after they have performed the sin. فَأُولَٰئِكَ يَتُوبُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ 
such people Allah will accept their tawbah. Wa kana Allahu aliman hakima. Allah is all knowing and very wise, meaning no one can fool him or deceive him. And then he says, wa laysat it tawbatu in the next verse, wa laysat it tawbatu lil ladina ya'maluna as-sayyi'at hatta idha habara ahadahum al-mawt قال إني تبت الآن ولا الذين يموتون وهم كفار أولئك أعتدنا لهم عذابا أليما. الله سبحانه وتعالى says توبه is not for those people who lead their lives freely committing and engaging in all kinds of sins and evil deeds until the time of death comes. they say قال إني تبت الآن. they say now I turn to Allah with repentance. ولا الذين يموتون وهم كفار. nor does Allah accept the توبه of those who die in a state of disbelief. For such people, Allah says, I have prepared a grievous penalty and a painful punishment. So, and that's why the, the principle is, the reason why this is not wise, this mentality that, you know, I can commit sins, eventually Allah will forgive me. You don't know if you will get the tawfiq for tawbah. You see, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had informed us that you're going to live for, let's say, 40 years, we could afford to spend 39 years in sins, and then on the 40th year, we know we're going to die, so we repent. But the problem is Allah has not informed us when we're going to die. Death can come up to us at any time. And if it finds us in a state of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is an open loss. So that is why the best thing is to prepare and to make our best efforts to stay away from sins if we fall into them by mistakes, and shaitan, as I said, he has got so many tricks up his sleeve, sometimes he's successful. In that case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you fall into sin by mistake, he wants you to know that he's never going to shut the door of repentance for you. He'll always welcome you. And the conditions that we mentioned, they are firm, but they are very lenient and they're designed to favor you. And the thing that you need to know is that after you make a mistake, the Prophet of Allah has this beautiful hadith in which he informs us. He says, Kullu ibn Adama khatta'un wa khayrul khatta'ina tawwabun. The Prophet of Allah says, all the children of Adam, all human beings make mistakes. It's our nature. We fall into the traps of shaitan. But he says, wa khayrul khatta'ina tawwabun. But the best sinners and the best makers of mistakes are those who are the quickest to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to try and reconnect themselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through tawbah and through istighfar. And that's why there are so many benefits that are promised for those people who do istighfar. In a hadith from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, we are informed that the Prophet of Allah said, مَنْ أَلْزَمَ نَفْسَهُ الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ مِنْ كُلِّ ضِيقٍ مَخْرَجَ وَمِنْ كُلِّ هَمٍ فَرَجَ وَرَزَقَهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ That a person who makes it his habit to perform istighfar every day, for such people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates an exit from every problem. And he frees them from all their worries and their concerns. And Allah provides them with rizq and sustenance from places where they cannot even imagine. So there are great rewards. And you know the connection and the correlation between istighfar and other things in our life. SubhanAllah, it's amazing. And this is really the benefit and the beauty of having a connection with the literature and teachings of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, that they tell you things that are very counterintuitive. A person once came to our fourth Imam, Imam Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin, and he said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I have a problem and my problem is that I have gone in my marriage for so many years, we have gone without any offspring. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for offspring and we don't have any offspring. This is a very common problem in many, many parts of the world. There are so many people who suffer from this and they try so many different remedies and solutions. The Imam gives a very simple spiritual solution and we don't realize it. He gave him the solution from Surah An-Nuh. He said that, عَلَيْكَ بِكَثْرَةِ الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ He said, do lots and lots of istighfar. And he said, have you not seen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Nuh, he quotes Prophet Nuh, saying, when Prophet Nuh gives his report to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about how he did tabligh among the people, he says, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ Anhara, that Prophet Nuh السلام, told his followers, and Allah quotes him in the Quran in Surah Nuh, that he said, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ I told my people, Ya Allah, I told them, that turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek his forgiveness, إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارَ Because he is very forgiving. If you do so, يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا He's going to send down rain upon you. He's going to send down his blessings upon you. وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ And he's going to supply you with wealth and with children. 
with sons. So basically the Imam correlated the mention of istighfar here. The result is when you do istighfar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala improves your life and he blesses you with the blessing of wealth and children and offspring and all these things. We read this, these verses almost every year, but we don't ponder over the connection and the correlation that there is. So there are so many benefits. At the end of the day, we need to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He has made these things clear. There is punishment and there is mercy. But as He tells us in the Quran, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ My mercy encompasses everything. And as we are told in the du'as, وَرَحْمَتُهُ سَبَقَتْ غَضَبَهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed His mercy before His anger. And He wants you to know that. No matter how many sins you've committed, He offers an open invitation in the Quran when He says, يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم O oh my servants who have transgressed against themselves and who have wronged themselves despair not in my mercy do not lose hope in my mercy verily I have the power and the capacity and the capability to forgive all your sins إنه هو الغفور الرحيم verily he is very forgiving and very merciful and that's why you find سبحان الله if you look at the level of his love and mercy and how it precedes his anger, even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a prophet to a sinner and a rebellious tyrant like Fir'aun, he reminds him of this reality. In the Quran, in Surah Taha, we are told, when Allah sent Prophet Musa alayhi salam and Harun to, to Fir'aun, such a corrupt and wicked ruler, even for him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Fir, uh, Prophet Musa alayhi salam that, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرُ أَوْ يَخْشَى O oh Musa, you're going to Fir'aun, speak to him softly, speak to him nicely and kindly so that he may, it might be that he may take heed. And in the riwayat, we are told that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Prophet Musa salam to Fir'aun, he also revealed to him, he said, Ya Musa, akhbirhu anni ila al-afwi wal-maghfirati wal-rahmati aqrabu wa asra'u wa amyalu minni ila al-adhabi wal-niqmati wal-ghadab. He said, O oh Musa, you're going to Fir'aun, but tell Fir'aun, that when it comes to showing mercy and forgiving, I am more close and I'm quicker and swifter and I'm more inclined towards forgiving and showing mercy than I am towards punishing and unleashing my wrath and my anger. So even to a person like Fir'aun, the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent was, my mercy and my forgiveness comes first, it comes before my punishment. If you want, you have the opportunity and you have the chance, you can take advantage of that. Well, obviously he rebelled and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala drowned him. But the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us in the Quran is that yes, his mercy and his love and his forgiveness comes before and that's why all these teachings that you find in the du'as and in the teachings and traditions and literature of the Ahlul Bayt they are aimed at inspiring you with hope. The aim is not to embolden you to commit sins. The aim is after you fall, shaitan will make his best efforts to make you lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he knows that you can undo all the hard work that he has done. So the only way he can prevent you and the only way he can be successful with you is if he can prevent you from returning back to Allah and he does that by inspiring you by, by disheartening you and by showing you that Allah will not accept you after the sin that you've done that's why the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and the Prophet of Allah they come into the picture and they tell you about how willing and how receptive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to those of his servants who approach him with tawbah and that's why I just want to share you know many of us Sometimes we have these doubts, you know, after committing sins, will Allah accept us or not? There are so many traditions that just go to show us how willing and how happy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually is to receive his servants back. Unlike human beings, as I mentioned yesterday, that even among human beings, we have a lot of people who forgive our sins and our mistakes, but they always scold you, they reprimand you, and after that they forgive you. In the case of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you just have to know how willing and how anxious Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to receive his servants back. We have a beautiful tradition that has been narrated by our fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad al-Baqir salawatullahi wa salamhu And he narrates this on the authority of the Prophet of Allah, that the Prophet of Allah said that inna Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ashaddu farahan بِتَوْبَةِ عَبْدِهِ مِنْ رَجُلٍ أَضَلَّ رَاحِلَتَهُ وَزَادَهُ فِي لَيْلَةٍ ظَلْمَاءَ فَوَجَدَهَا فَاللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى أَشَدُّ فَرَحًا بِذَلِكَ الْعَبْدِ حِينَ وَجَدَ رَاحِلَتَهُ وَزَادَهُ the Prophet of Allah gives an example. He was ov obviously addressing the Arabs, Bedouin Arabs. So he gave them an example that they could relate to. He says, you don't realize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the love that he has for you and the value that you have in his sight. Obviously, you are his investments. He has invested so much in you. He does not want to send you to the fire of hell. And that's why when you commit sins 
and you commit, you start living a lifestyle that leads to, towards that outcome, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with that. But when you make, your, make up your mind to do tawbah and return back to the shade of his obedience, Allah actually welcomes you back and he's very pleased by that. How pleased is Allah with that? The Prophet gives an example. He says, imagine a person, he was addressing the Arabs, imagine a Bedouin Arab, Arabs were basically nomads. They didn't lead a settled existence. They used to roam about in the desert. And so they didn't have the Bedouin Arabs. They would not have houses. Everything would be on their camel. All their property and all their possessions would be on their camels. And they would move around here and there in search of pasture. So we, the Prophet of Allah says, imagine a Bedouin Arab who travels through the desert. And then he is with his camel and all his possessions, all everything that he owns is on that camel. In the middle of the night, he falls asleep and the camel goes astray. He loses the camel with everything that he owns. How distressed is this Bedouin Arab going to be? When he wakes up in the morning, he finds his camel has gone. There is no, no trace of it. It's gone with all his provisions, all his food, his water, everything was on that camel. It's gone. And then the Prophet of Allah says, this Bedouin Arab, he begins to roam the desert. Finally, he chances upon his camel. He sees his camel coming back to him intact with all his provisions and everything just the way it was. How happy and how delighted is this camel going to be? The Prophet of Allah says, Inna Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ashaddu farahan bi tawbati abdihi min rajulin adalla rahilatahu wa zadahu min laylatin dhalma'a fawajadaha. The Prophet of Allah says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when a servant makes the decision to do tawbah and to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sincerely repents from his sin, Allah is happier and his happiness is greater than the happiness that would be experienced by that person when he finds his camel. Because you see, every single human being who goes astray, that's basically every time shaitan is successful with, a, with any human being, that is essentially more than 50 million dollars of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's investments going to the fire of hell. And Allah doesn't want that. When, that, when the possibility and the prospect of that coming back Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very much pleased. He's ple more pleased than that. In another riwayah, we are told that the Prophet of Allah gave other examples. Because you see, living in the modern world today, you don't understand what the camel means to the Arab. So that's why you might not be able to relate to this example. The Prophet of Allah gives other examples. I guess if he was speaking to a modern audience, he would have given examples that you would be able to relate to. Like for most people today, the things that they can't live without or their whole life revolves around, you know, these gadgets that we have today. The Blackberry or the iPhone or, you know, some of these computers that we have or the iPad mini or so, something of that sort. So you, most modern men and women cannot imagine life without that. And imagine if you lost that, if you had everything on your, on your iPhone or on your Blackberry and you lost it, how distressed would you be? I mean, you would be beyond, you, you would be inconsolable with grief if you lost that. Because some people, yeah, I, I remember there was this young boy who was very fond of his Blackberry. His mother used to go around telling people that my son got married. And they would be like, well, he's so young, he's only 16, who's the lucky girl? And they, she would be like, it's not so much whom, it's what? He, he's married to his Blackberry. It's like every single day, ev all the hours of the day he's with his Blackberry. He eats with it, he sleeps with it, every time he's with it. So to me, that Blackberry, it seems like my daughter-in-law. It's, it's like he's married to it. So I guess such a youth or such a boy or girl, you lose your Blackberry or you, or you lose your iPhone. It's, it's got everything on it. And then suddenly you get it back. How pleased and how happy are you going to be? That's something that was precious to you. It's come back to you. You become very happy. The Prophet of Allah says, you are that valuable in the sight of Allah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he loses you, he's not pleased with that. And when you come back and you join the shade of his obedience, of those who are on the path of his obedience, he becomes very happy. In another riwayah, we are told the Prophet gives other examples. He says, Inna Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ashaddu farahan bi tawbati abdihi min al-aqeem al-walid wa min al-dal al-wajid wa min al-dhamaan al-wajid. He says, you know how happy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when his servants turn back to him and seek his forgiveness and make up their minds and make a decision that they will not disobey him again? Allah is happier than min al-aqeem al-walid. The Prophet says, imagine a couple who get married for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, they go without any children, they're childless, without offspring. All of a sudden, from nowhere, they get this really beautiful baby. How happy and how ecstatic are they going to be with joy? He says, Allah is even happier than that. He, the other example he gives is al dhamaan al-warid. He says, imagine a person who is walking, he's thirsty in the desert, in the scorching heat of the desert, he's completely hydrated, there is no trace of water, suddenly his eyes fall upon a glacier or, or an oasis out there. How happy is this person going to be? 
Prophet of Allah says Allah's happiness is even greater than that. The Prophet of Allah purposely he gives you these weak examples. Obviously, divine happiness cannot be compared to human happiness. But he was speaking to Bedouin Arabs and he wanted to explain to them the intensity and magnitude of divine pleasure and happiness when the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make up their minds to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why he gave these examples. So really, all those doubts and all those whisperings from shaitan that come to our mind that you know, I've done, I've wronged myself and I have sinned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Will he accept me? Will I be forgiven? All these doubts are cleared when you turn to the teachings of the Quran and the riwayat and traditions of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. They give you a completely different picture. They give you a picture by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually anxious and willing to receive you back. He's happy to receive you back into the shade of his obedience. In uh, riwayat, we are told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Prophet Dawood alayhi salam. He said, Ya Dawood, law ya'lamu al-mudbiruna anni mada ishtiyaqi ilayhim wa antidhari lahum lamatu shawqa. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if those of my servants, Allah loves all of his servants, even those who are not walking on his path, Allah loves them as well. And that's why Allah says, those of my servants who are distant from me, who don't connect with me, who are leading their lives in my disobedience, if they knew how anxiously I await their return to the right path, and how much I'm willing, how much love and mercy I'm willing to accept them with, if they knew this, they would have died with, with delight. But they don't know this, most people don't. And shaitan convinces them into thinking that, you know what? You, this is not for you, Tawbah is not for you, forgiveness is not for you and that's why that is how he discourages us because he knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the counter challenge that he gave to shaitan was not that and you can go on misleading my servants, I will automatically forgive them. No. He said, La azalu aghfiru lahum mastaghfaruni. I will keep on forgiving them for as long as they keep on coming to me and seeking my forgiveness. So the condition is you, as long as you keep on returning back to Allah, you do that istighfar and you sincerely seek his forgiveness. And you know, istighfar is not something very simple. We don't have time. There is actually a hadith of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi In which... He saw a man saying Astaghfirullah and in the A'mal we say it 100 times, 70 times. You have to know Istighfar is a frame of mind. It's not just a statement that you utter. A person said Astaghfirullah in front of Amirul Mu'mineen. Amirul Mu'mineen said that you have said Astaghfirullah. Do you know what the condition, have you satisfied the conditions? There are certain conditions that you have to satisfy before you actually do the Istighfar. And he mentioned six conditions. I'll just mention two of the most important ones which are that he says first of all you experience remorse for one stage and that's why the Quran talks of a very dangerous situation whereby Allah SWT says أَفَمَنْ زُيِّنَ لَهُ سُوءُ عَمَلِهِ فَرَآهُ حَسَنًا Sometimes a person may do an evil deed thinking it is good. If you do it thinking that it is good, you will never experience that remorse. The first stage of Tawbah is you have to experience remorse. And after experiencing that remorse, that remorse should inspire you to make a promise with yourself that you will never ever repeat the act that you did. So these are all stages that you have to go through. I realize my time is up. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give all of us the tawfiq to take benefit of this institution of Istighfar that he has established, especially in these nights, and give us the opportunity to never repeat the sins that we have committed in the past, to forgive our sins, and to accept our a'mal. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَ